in the first class, I said lots of things about Euler's formula and fundamental theorem of algebra. Remember that? That was analogy from physics and purely mathematical application. And the third thing I said is this Riemann surface. And I said, this dominates and motivates, not dominates, motivates um, modern mathematics, like, you know, 80% of uh, modern mathematics that follows uh, in that era. So it's a Riemann surface here. And also I'd like to mention that this is going to be the last thing in, um, before we enter calculus. So let me phrase it like this. What we've been doing is a pretty much a pre-calculus stuff. Think about it. If you learn mathematics, before you enter calculus, all you did is you just learn algebra and think about the function, how the graph of a function looks like, and things like that. That's a pre-calculus level, right? All about elementary function. Okay? So that's what we've been doing. Only thing that it's an, we're adding in here, that graph part is we're adding in here. That's just a Riemann surface. Once this one is done, we can't afford stretching this one to two classes. We have to end it today, however far I go. And then um, on Thursday, we're going to enter calculus. We're going to differentiate and integrate. And hopefully, uh, you, we pick up the speed there <laughs> and do much faster than we've been doing. But I, th I think... Uh, you know, really getting ourselves familiar with this geometry of our domain is really important. And uh, think about how you started Calc 3 before you actually differentiate. You think about the vectors and all that, and that's the same analogy we're doing here. All right, last thing is Riemann surface. First, let me um, give you an um, answer. Um, what is Riemann surface? What is it? Here's an answer. There's a fancy answer, it's very abstract, and later that developed, but what I'm about to describe is hard enough and concrete enough, and you will be able to understand it. It's a graph of two variable, um, equation in complex number. Graph of a two variable equation in, in complex numbers. Okay, so but first let me um, give you a version of a real part, an example. The graph of two variable equation, let me um, write it down for example, y equals minus x cubed plus x equals zero. Does it look like a two variable equation? Right, two variable equation, one two variable equation in real numbers. Okay? Now there's an equation and there's a graph, right? Um, the command for the, for the um, in Mathematica is a contour plot. Contour plot of this one, it'll sketch this graph. But this is very special graph. So you can see I, it's really easy to isolate y, don't you think? Correct? So Let's do that. That's the same as y equals x cubed minus x. The graph of this equation is really the graph of a function x cubed minus x, right? So you know how that looked like? It looks like like this and like that. That's a graph. That's a graph of y minus x cubed plus x equals zero. If you, without thinking about, you can manipulate it, contour plot, and this whole thing equal to zero, and it's gonna the Mathematica will sketch that. Make sense? That's the graph. Now these two variables x and y uh, takes up one, you know, real axis and another real axis. Therefore, we write it in abbreviation and Cartesian product of two real line that takes up a two dimension, right? But when you do this graph of a two variable equation and complex numbers, one complex number to visualize represented it already takes up a two real dimension, right? And to represent the other complex variable, you have to use another two real dimensions, right? Altogether, how many dimensions is it? It's a dimension four, okay? So you can't really visualize it. And that's the problem. That's the whole thing about this thing. So we're doing this. The second question, and how do we visualize it?
answers you can't really visualize this one. You can only think about, you know, you can only define all the, uh, the geometry that we algebraically defined. So what we are going to do here, one way to visualize is that the idea of this homeomorphism So let me use this this real example to visualize homeomorphism. What does the homeomorphism preserve is kind of how it's connected, how it's connected. That's what this really means. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna use this example as an example in here. The graph of this uh, real two-variable equation looks like this. You can see how it's curved around. You feel all the geometry of this curve. You can differentiate and you can calculate the curvature if you remember what those are from Calc 3, right? But suppose uh, you're somewhat impaired, so you cannot see two dimension. okay? You only can see the one dimension, so we, d we realize it all right. Here is our only one dimension. We can't see this, but there's realize I can, you know, create a nice map which is a continuous map. Remember what a continuous map is? Continuous map does not rip apart your domain. If this is thing is like this, there's going to be a one to one, and it doesn't rip apart. So one to one is the other property. So if I put all the points down in it, if this point is going to go down in here, that point is come down in here, that point is come down in here. If it's below, it is coming up here. You see all the points in that y equals x cubed minus x is going to come down to x-axis. One-to-one -one fashion. Do you believe that? One-to-one -one fashion. There's no point above it. There are two points collapsing down to one, right? So this idea is a projection. Usually the projection is not one-to-one, -one, but this is clearly, you see, is one-to-one, -one, right? And it's continuous. And if you think about going backward map, which is inverse of what I just described. I take this flat, the nice line, and then I could bent around. You have to stretch it and see how the, the spacing of this point so here is nicely spaced. The point, if you go around, maybe this point is a far, a far apart. So this nice, the line is like a clay line or a you know, stretchable line is all stretched then becomes this one. This transformation is one-to-one -one fashion, but there's a lot of stretches involved, but there's no ripping apart. Okay? So we can't see this one. We can only see this one. We come down to the, the level we can see it. So we believe it preserves something. How things are connected. Is it connected? This is homeomorphism. How it's connected is preserved in down there in R. All right? So here's an, another example. Suppose um, there is in this segment hovering in R3. You know what that means, right? There's a space curve. Here's a closed end and open end. For some reason, you can't see this three-dimensional world, but you can only see the two-dimensional world. And some somebody gave you this map. You just plug it in there, and Mathematica created this two-dimensional image down to one-to-one. -to -one. Two-dimensional image is the following. That closed point comes here, and a loop, loop around, and then open-ended, close it up here. So that when you just look at this image, you don't see the open end and where is the beginning and an end. It's just one complete circle. Make sense? Now, the only information we have is this is actually hovering inside a three-dimensional space, and this is the only thing that we can have. One-to-one -one fashion is continuous. There's no ripping apart, right? Everything, all the points in here, neighborhood points, is exactly going to the neighborhood points. All the points around it here, exactly going to the neighborhood point. That's the meaning of the continuous. The points around the neighborhood points also go to the neighborhood points. There's no right end part is going over there, and left end, left part of the points is going to the far away part. That's the definition of continuous. Okay? So suppose you did that. Now, you will, next thing is that is this the connectedness that you see here? Is that really representing the connectedness of three dimensional thing? Is about how this map is going back to that one. It's still one to one. 
this closed end point is going back to that point, and all the point is one to one fashion. But all of a sudden, we lose this continuous part. Do you know where we lose the continuous part? If you look at this point in here, P, left uh, kind of this point right here is going to that part, right? But if you look at that point, which is a neighborhood point in that image down there, where do they go? Sorry, that. They go all the way to here, right? Right here, they're just neighborhood points. Now, when you send it back to this R3, and uh, one neighborhood goes to this part, and the other neighborhood goes to that part, that's far apart from each other. Is that continuous? It's not continuous. This, this ring is ripped apart and embedded into R3. Okay? So this is not, um, this image here, because it failed to uh, be continuous in the backward map, it is not really representing the connectedness of the actual thing that is sitting inside the R3 that we can't see. Does that make sense? All right, there is this thing that we want to figure out how things are connected. We map it down to one-to-one -one fashion, and we have this image. The question is that, is this image, the projection, is really representing the connectedness of the original guy? It is depending on your map going back. Your map going back is not continuous, just like this one. Then this connectedness of this one is not really representing the connectedness of the original image. Okay? But this is a still the situation, and then you have to look this not continuous map closely to see how they are glued it, um, together. And that's what we're about to do. Okay? All right. So first example, this part, how do we visualize this graph that in the sitting inside four-dimensional real, uh, real hyphen four-dimensional space and how it's connected? We can't do that, so we have to um, make the cuts and one-to-one -one map, right? Maybe there's a something like that. You have to rip apart in each individual part so that you can send them down. So the answer to this one, you make the cuts of the original graph and use one-to-one -one map down to um, a place where we can see. And hopefully this example of real thing kind of gives you a little bit of idea. So here's the actual complex. Let's enter. This is a complex example. All right. Now, Riemann surface R is now Z comma W. Z and W are complex variables, right? Two complex variable. And and here it's a simple equation. All right? Okay. So if it is real, what is the answer to this one? Parabola, right? Y equals x squared. This is a parabola, y equals x squared. So z is a um, kind of horizontal variable. Now, this is not real. So um, this idea is about, is it possible to map it down one-to-one -one fashion? Okay? This one-to-one -one could be a little bit tricky, and you'll see it in here. Um, this is going to be projection map. I'm going to call it phi. All right? The idea is this. Given that z, w is completely determined, I you think all this point is z, w, z, comma, w, w is completely determined given Z, right? So if you just collect Z um, down to C, this is a Riemann surface. Does it look like Riemann surface? Collection of all two variables satisfying one, one uh, two variable equation, then is given by phi of Z comma W. We have two things. Where does it send? Just collect Z. Seems like Z is a dominating variable. W is completely determined. All right? So if it is a real thing, it's we have y equals x squared there, right? And you look at each individual point, only care about x part. So it is the, exactly the projection map here, right there. y equals x squared. Forget about w, just collect x coordinates. So all those points in here, forget the y part, just collect x part. Does it look like projection now? Yeah. yeah. So here... There are some bunch of points that ignore certain patterns as collected. This is one-to-one, -one, actually. All right.
right. So you know the definition of one-to-one? -one? If there's a two points going to, you know, potentially different, going to the same thing, they actually have to do the same thing. So here's one-to-one. -one. Um, so here's a definition. If two points, Z1 and W1, and Z2 and W2, they might be exactly the same points in C cross C. And whenever this is the case, there's no possibility. They're always equal. Z1 is exactly Z2, and W1 is exactly W2. Okay? Whenever your function value is equal, and your input value must be equal to each other, that's the one-to-one. -one. No two points are mapped to the same thing. Make sense? All right. So you can... You know, write down. Okay, what is what is this um, the map? What is the map? G one W one. This is the definition of one to one. I'd like to go for the definition of phi. This is a definition of one to one. One to one. And what is the definition of phi? What do, you do what do we do about these two points? Here's the definition of phi. If I give you two complex number, you ignore the second complex number, only accept the first complex number. That's what that means. So what is this? Z1, right? Okay. What about this one? Z2. So given condition is that phi1, phi z1, w1 is equal to phi z2, w2, right? So that is equivalent to z1 is equal to w uh, z2. Why does that imply? These two things. Obviously, Z1 is equal to Z2, right? But why is W1 is equal to W2? Because Ws are completely determined by Z1, right? So here, and and W1 is a Z1 squared, right? W2 is a Z2 squared. That's how we collected the points from the Riemann surface. It's not arbitrary W. W is determined by Z. Therefore, Z1 and Z2 is equal to each other. Therefore, W1 and W2 is equal to each other. So that proves it. That's how you prove it algebraically at one to one. You write it down. Two arbitrary points that are mapping the same thing, you actually show that the, those two inputs are exactly the same input. Never happened to two other things mapped in thing. That's one to one. So that's one to one map. All the thing is going back to one to one map. So, and it's a surge active. You see, there's a surge active. Every point in here is coming from somewhere there. So, it's a surge active part. The definition of a surge active is that if you choose, you know, go, map is going from the Riemann abstract Riemann surface there to this complex number. If I choose U in the code domain, then there is some point to ZW such that it maps to that W for some complex number Z and W that is coming from um, complex number, or you can do C cross C. So the, um, this abstract thing that we cannot visualize, but there's a map is well defined as one to one, but if you choose anything in here, there's always something that is mapping onto that, okay? So that's what that the definition is. So if I choose a U, so why is that that the phi is surjective? So it's a proof. Why is that so? Let U be arbitrary in C. That's what that target here is, right? How do you find this Z and W? Then we want to solve phi of ZW equals u. Isn't that the surjective part? I choose anything in the target. I want to find the z and w. Under that phi map, it goes to that u. Is that right? Okay. So let's solve this equation. So what is the phi of z? I mean phi of zw. Just the z, right? Yeah, it's just the z is equal to u. u is given, right? And we're solving for W. So what is, um, so we solve for W. What about, um, solve for Z. So what is the W part? 
we figured out what the z is, right? How do you figure out w? Because it came from the Riemann surface, w is always z squared. So if you figure out w and z, and w is always a z squared. Therefore, what I've shown here is that phi of z and w z squared is going to map to u, I'm sorry. That's u is given, and the u is given. That point u and u squared is in that Riemann surface, and this is going down to um, u in there. So I found it. u and u squared is, you know, a Riemann surface, a u and u squared there. So, very nice. Everything is coming back is one to one. One to one and surjective, what is the name for that? It's a bijective, right? So, it's a bijective. So, that. So, established. Phi going from that Riemann surface down to C is bijective. And. Is continuous. It only uses you. You have two variables, z and w. Only thing you're doing is to that is just ignoring. So we're not doing anything. I don't know if it is um, intuitive enough. It is a continuous. You have a z and w, and you know whether z is close to and these points are close to any any other points is the same as one point is close to any other points in three-dimensional space and two-dimensional space in a real thing. Okay? It's the same same way. So um, if two points, Z1 and Z W1 and Z2 and W2, if they're really close to each other, what that really means, and Z1 and Z2 are close to each other, W1 and W2 are close to each other, right? And if these maps are going down to Z1 and Z2, right? And they're close to each other. So would you believe that is a continuous? If I choose two points that are very close to each other, under this map, the image is also very close to each other. Right? Okay. So it's continuous, surjective, bijective, very good, right? But I also required backward is also continuous. Right? All this thing that I've shown before and here is that this is exactly one-to-one -one fashion and surjective down to this loop. But when you go back, you lose the continuity. Although one way is continuous, backward is not continuous, right? So you have to guarantee that, is this really the C, the whole plane is representing how this Riemann surface is really connected in that abstract four-dimensional space, right? What is the key? If the backward map is continuous, we believe the C is embedded into four-dimensional spe uh, space without ripped apart. Does that make sense? This is one-to-one -one fashion. And when C is going inside the four-dimensional space, because the fact if this is continuous, it means entire C is just wobbled around and go inside the four-dimensional, and there's no ripping apart. Does that make sense? Now, backward map is that if I have two complex numbers, Z1 and Z2, right? Where do they go? You know the backward map? Z1 goes to exactly Z1, right? How about W part? W is determined by square map. So it's a Z1 squared, right? So that's where Z1 is going. What about Z2? Where is this Z2 going? Z2 and Z2 squared, right? If these two things are close to each other, you believe the Z1 and Z2 are close to each other? That's a silly statement, right? If Z1 and Z2 are close to each other, do you believe that Z1 squared and Z2 squared are close to each other? Kind of, right? That's true in the real numbers. You believe the continuity of the square map. X1 and X2 are close to each other. X1 squared and X2 squared are close to each other. They're stretched apart a little bit. But the behavior, as you squeeze down to closer and closer, that the fact that they're closer and closer to the zero, an image part, is preserved in there. Actual distance and that one, that is a stretched. But as I squeeze this one further and further to zero, their distance and further and further down to zero, although it's a little still apart. Does that make sense? So if you believe this is continuous, um, this part is continuous, that makes this entire thing continuous. So I'm showing that this C is not ripped apart. 
It's just sort of bent around and sits inside the four-dimensional space we don't see. And we're saying, I'm saying that we can't really see this guy inside the four-dimensional space, but the way it is connectedness is exactly like a C. If you travel around it being a little ant on this Riemann surface, within the four-dimensional space, it's exactly the same as just wandering around this flat world. You see there's this books about flat world and written for it in the general relativity and things like that. And that you can't really see, but it is represented in here. The traveling experience is pretty much the same as a scene in there, if you ignore all the other things that's going on in that part. So what it really preserved is just connectedness, not the actual geometry. All right? Okay, so what have we established in here is that the statement, the Riemann surface that is defined in abbreviation like this, is this notation okay? Two variable, I'm just dropping that z comma w, right? Is kind of the same thing as c, right? That notation is this Wiggly notation. If you bring this statement to the mathematician and they will ask, what do you mean by this Wiggly st statement? There are different type of equivalent classes. And then you can point it out. What I mean by this one is, what was that fancy word? Homeomorphism. Yeah, homeomorphism. Homeomorphism. What does that mean? Backward and forward, surjective, and backward and forward, continuous. There's no ripping apart. The C is exactly going in there, being turned around. All right? Well, here's the hard way of doing this. And from there, we learn um, what to do with a more difficult. Right? So we already know this fact. So I'm an alternative hard way of approaching. And there's a lesson from that. Here's the same Riemann surface, w equals z squared. For some reason, you didn't see that. The w is nicely isolated. If you project it down to just a z coordinate, everything is fine. Suppose you didn't see that. And you begin to manipulate. I want to isolate z. I love to isolate the z. And you try that. And what is the um, answer to that? This is called square root of w, right? Z is the square. There's no plus minus. Remember, this is a complex. So how do you enter better ln notation? This is w to the 1 half. Remember that? How do you enter the definition? What is the definition of w to the 1 half? e to the 1 half little ln w. Is that right? Little ln w. Let's write this one better. So what is that? E to the 1 half. So this is standard uh, notation to switching from E to EXP. Um, in the book, they also write it because they tired of doing the superscript. <laughs> EXP is represented E to the... This is 1 half there. What is their next part? How do you write this ln w in better way? Or using... Principal logarithm, that's what I meant, right? So what do you add? 2k pi i, right? 2k pi i. So in that, the z equals exponential. So we have, really what matters here is 1 half is log, let's not skip that, w, and we have k pi i. Is that right? Okay. So this one has infinitely many possibility, right? But after you go through the exponential, what happened? Only what and what matters? Zero matters. If I put zero there, exponential of zero pi i. Does anybody know exponential of zero pi i? Sorry about this notation. You have to get used to. What is the exponential of zero pi i? What's that? 1. Okay. So when k equals 0, that additional factor contributes to 1. When k equals 1, what does that happen? 1 times pi i. Does anybody know what 1 times pi i is?
Is that negative 1? Here is a pi i seems like um, this is the same as e to the pi i, right? Remember Euler's formula? This is a cosine. The theta pi is over here to you. So it's a negative 1, correct? So that contributed to negative 1, right? What if it is a 2? Then you go back and then 2 there. Exponential of a 2 pi i is the same as 0 pi i, right? So it would begin to repeat. So we only, um, only thing that really matters after you go through the exponential is k equals 0 and k equals 1. Before we enter exponential, that's how you calculate square root of something. Remember? You know, nth root, you calculate theta 0 plus k pi, 2k pi i divided by n, where n is the denominator of that exponent. Remember that part? This one is picking up that one in, in generality like this. All right, so there are two functions involved. So I'm going to write it like this. I'm trying to isolate z in terms of w. Then you couldn't do that. We have to consider two possibilities, right? So here's, here's how. This r1 seems like given by, we, if we look at this equation, I couldn't rewrite this equation nicely. You have to separate the parts. So one part of the r1 is a z equals this part k equals 0, which is exponential 1 half log w, 0 is this end in here. Is that right? You looked at all the z and w, it seems like this is one possibility. So I'm going to label it w1, z1. Okay? So these are coming from this original r, right? And the other one is coming from r2. If you look at the other possibility, k equals 1, if you plug in a 1 in there, the z2 is exponential 1 half log w2 plus what? k equals 1, so there's a pi i, right? Okay, so if I have w1, z1 is this time completely determined, and that w1 um, comma from there we have a point z1 comma w1 right that is sitting inside there and we get a point from here z2 comma w2 where w2 is a main variable and kind of z2 is completely determined that guy is a sitting in there when you isolate a w you didn't have to separate these two things there's one function that takes care of all this back and forth map but now, when you try to isolate um, z1 and z part, is ripped apart into two parts. So for this, so you can see the function part log and function part log. That's exactly the same thing. So you're going to basically end up at plugging the same w there, but you're going to have different type of z1 and z2. They're mapping in there. All right. So if you write it like this, there's a little problem with the w1. w1 cannot be zero there, right? because you can't plug in the 0 there. But is w being 0 here make sense? If I plug in w is equal 0, then z is going to be 0, right? So it's OK. So if you separate it like this, where does w equals 0 go? Nowhere, right? So we have to include it in that part. That's the only part that is not defined. So include w equals 0. So I'm going to write it like this. w1 equals 0. And here, allow w2 equals 0, right? But you can't plug it in there, right? When w1 equals 0, what should be the z1? w equals 0, z should be 0. So it's a 0. Although this is not defined, this has to be separately defined. It's called piecewise defined function, right? So here's the same thing. If the w2 is 0, we should define z2 equals 0, like that. Now there's r one solid chunk, we did the wrong thing to that, so we have to separate it into two pieces, right? If I have consider all, if I consider all the W's, there's a Z's uh, uh, figured it out. But only special case, this is W1 zero being 0, W2 being 0, they have to specially consider 0 and 0. And this co point is 0 comma 0, that point is 0 comma 0, right? Isn't that the same thing? So 0 comma 0 is included in there and 0 comma 0 is included in there. 
when we put this R1 and R2 in back into the three uh, four dimensional space, this zero comma zero comma this that same point is going to the same thing, right? So we have you can see that it's not like R1 and R2 is just completely disjoint. There is a one overlap in that point. So that's one thing. All right. Now, the next part is a key. So this, I'm um, looking at this one as the um, R1. So I'm going to call the phi one. The homeomorphism map. phi 1 okay that is going to be um, taking r1 down to r1 is it looks like there's a w and a z that's satisfying this one and um, to get a nice one-to-one -one map you map it down to the main variable which is w and w1 in here so that's going to be the c w1 here you can put anything in there, right? Except zero. But we also allow this, you know, w1 equals zero and it's mapped to w0. So everything is going to be mapped. Um, I think I said this one wrong. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence. That's what I meant to say. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's given by phi1 of a z1 and w1. Where does that go? W1, the main variable in here, and Z is a dependent variable, it's the main variable. If you go through the same argument that we did before, this is going to be a one-to-one -one function. Okay? If, if you consider two points going mapped down, because the, you know, the main variable should be the same, the, the other one should be the same as well. So that's the function. And the second homeomorphism, you take those R2 and C phi2, you take those two coordinates and map it down to w2, which is the main variable that determines r1 and r2. That's one-to-one. -one. Okay? So when you consider this backward map, if this is continuous, then you believe um, one part of this and the C, it's one copy of exactly the C is there. So suppose I'm going to do, it's not continuous, but I'm going to give you a little picture of what's going on here. The C is going in there. And so here's a copy of C hovering inside a three dimensional space, right? And here's another copy of C hovering inside a three dimensional space. Does that make sense? If I know that when they go inside and in there, the only inter um, overlapping point is a zero comma zero. Then there's a zero comma zero. There's a zero comma zero. What, what is supposed to happen when you map it back to Riemann surface of the original one? They're the same points, right? So they're going to be glued together. So you have to be glued together. So it's just like point there, point there. That's a zero comma where the zero comma zero is going. One copy of a C is kind of pinched down. <laughs> so that you can glue just one point of these two things. If this is the case, C is mapping into the uh, R1 back and R2 back, and in here, if the only intersection point of R1 and R2 is this one, the shape of, the homeomorphism shape of our Riemann surface is actually looking like this. That's what we have accomplished. But it is not. And, and that, that gets more complicated. Okay? It's not continuous. not continuous. I'm going to show you where the not continuous part is kicking in. So remember, if it is not continuous, then what's going to happen to C? It's going to be ripped apart, right? It's going to be ripped apart, and the, these two things are going to be glued together. So the um, backward map is, what is this backward map? It's one to one, phi one, in bus. of C, going back to R1 map. Because of this, you know, going forward one-to-one, -one, backward is also one-to-one, -one, right? So let's think about phi1 inverse. So what is the main variable in C? It's W1, right? 
So what happened when you go back, it goes back to the W1. When you go back in here, and you have to write down the Z1, right? What is the Z1? Z1 is completely determined by this formula. So I'm writing it back in here. This is exponential. One half and log of W1. Does it look like a map? You're down there in one variable C, and you're going back to two variable. Um, you can see this map going backward, W1 exactly going there. And what about the Z1? Z1 is completely determined by this equation Z1 there. So the backward map is written like this, W1 going to W1. W1 is um, going into second component through this map. All right? So I'm going to write down the second inverse map. Also one to one, what would that be? Phi one W two. Right? Where do they go? Exponential. What's the difference between these two map? There's this pi i thing, right? Okay? All right, what is the next question we, we think about? We consider this backward map. We wrote down this nice formula right there, correct? What is the next question? We ask whether it's a continuous or not. If it's continuous, it's going to be like this, right? It's not continuous. Let's figure out. You look at this W1 going to W1. Isn't that continuous map? W2 going to the W2. Nothing happened. The whole chunk is exactly embedded in there. If it is not continuous, it's here. Okay, so let's look at it here. Think about what happened. You separate that part. W1 mapping into this part right there. Why is this not continuous? W1, how does W1 look like? W1 is coming from the entire complex plane. Is that right? All right, this one is going through that map. This is a Z1 place. Remember, this is Z1 place? But does anybody know the answer? Where this is not going to... I said, if I have one point in here, through that map, all the neighbor points should go to the neighbor point, right? Shouldn't be completely separated. This log has this principal argument part. Remember, log has, you know, the modulus part is continuous, so the principal log part is not. So I'm going to show you this part, this part in here. This part right there, so I'm going to look at negative 1. What happened to negative 1 is that uh, exponential of 1 half log of negative 1. Isn't that what we're doing? Right? Okay. So what is it? Anybody like to go for exponential of log negative 1? Let's do log negative 1 first. Length 1, right? So that's going to be log 1. What about argument? Pi, right? Pi. Negative 1 is over here, so the argument is pi. This is a pi. That's what you get. So what is it? This is 0, right? It's so exponential of pi i over 2. Is that right? Where is this exponential of pi over 2 I is in this, in this spot here? Up there. So that's where it's going. All right? So um, it turns out the point right below is a problem. So if you look at this part in there, that's going to be something. Um, let me almost out of time, so let me. So I'm going to describe that like this. Is this one look like e to the um, theta i, where theta is um, kind of very close to a negative pi? but s smaller than, uh, greater than negative pi. It's almo almost close to negative pi, right? Almost close to negative pi. But it's a slightly greater than negative pi. It's a below 
think about counterclockwise rotation, negative pi is slow. Is that right? If you just point right underneath it, then the angle there is slightly greater than negative pi going uh, counterclockwise. So if you go through that uh, red point, let me use this red color. So what happened is x exponential, one half, logarithmic uh, branch. What is this? E to the i theta. That's what that is, right? I'm plugging in that complex number into this function, um, w1. So it's e to the i theta, right? Okay. So what do we know about um, modulus of this number? e to the i theta modulus still on the unit circle right it's modulus 1 how about principal argument this theta if if i write it like this it's a principal argument right yeah so it's like this theta being a little bit greater than negative pi but very close to negative pi that is a principal argument right yeah but it could be other than 3 pi, you know, the different, but the theta, as you described, is exactly that. So what happened in here is a zero, is this exponential 1 half i theta, right? So um, this one is theta is very close to, so this one is close to 1 half i theta to, this is close to negative pi, right? So I put a negative pi there, negative pi. This is not equal, it's very close to negative pi. So what is this one? E to the negative um, pi i 2, right? So where did that go? Can you point it in here? We calculated all that. Down there, right? Down here, underneath it here. So these are very close points. Negative 1 and around it, they should go to same point, right? If I really, really get it closer and closer, this is going to be really, really over here and they're really, really over there. They're completely ripped apart. Okay? So what happens is that this pi line, the argument pi line, is going to that line there, and right underneath it, this red line is going to that line in there. So all the other complex numbers is in between this rotation, um, uh, what is it called? Um, orientation of rotation is always the same. You start from there, you uh, counterclockwise rotate to cover all that, right? You start with this dotted line and counterclockwise rotate all that. So this entire thing is a map. This entire complex plane, if there is a ripped apart along this negative real line, break it apart, and that closed boundary line is going there, that open boundary line right underneath it is going there, and everything else is shoved inside of the half of the plane in one-to-one -one fashion. It's kind of like shrunk it, but there's no collapse of the molecules, right? If there's molecules in there, the space between the molecules is kind of shrunk, but there's no collapse, but it's a set theoretic version. What happens is here's a complex plane, cut it out, keep the boundary, an open boundary, and then do that. We have one more thing to do in the other one map, right? Do you know what happened to the other one map? They go and fill up the, the other half. They patch it completely and recover our original discovery that R was really homeomorphic to C. It's a hard way of looking at a simple thing, but it has use whenever we enter a complex e equation. You look at the copies of this one and cut it out and think about where, where things are going where and glue them together. Sometimes you get a picture like this. You have one copies and the second copies of it and you cut it out, think about where this one is gluing together and you end up a picture like this. So this is called Riemann surface. Doing the calculus to that Riemann surface burst out the new error, differential geometry, Lie algebra that gives you the um, general rel relativity, standard models. All this is coming from this idea of considering this Riemann surface. It's hugely important in the modern science. But this is all we could cover today, <laughs> even going over time a little bit. Um, um, homework will be made.